Thank you very much, and thanks for everyone for being here today. So my lab primarily focuses on using computational methods to understand what non-coding and regulatory genetic variation is doing in our cells and ultimately the effect on complex disease. So the motivation behind this, as most of you know, is that most variants in the human genome in the population and most disease-associated variants are non-coding. So this presents a number of challenges. The two that I'll be focusing on today is that when we look at things like GWAS, we have limited ability to immediately understand what a non-coding disease-associated variant is actually doing, what are its mechanisms, and therefore, how could we possibly design interventions or drugs that might um, help us treat these disorders? And second, when we start moving to whole genome sequencing and looking at actual individual personal genomes, all of these non-coding rare variants are extremely difficult for us to understand or predict their effects. So I'm going to talk about both of these problems today, beginning with understanding the regulatory effects of GWAS variants and moving on at the end to understanding what we can do with rare variants. So again, going back to the motivation, most of the variants that we're getting out of GWAS, as you know, are non-coding, so we cannot immediately understand what they do. So one of the tools that I've been working with for a long time is using gene expression data to map EQTLs, or expression quantitative trait loci. And EQTL is simply an association between genotype at a particular genetic locus and the RNA, usually RNA, expression levels of a particular gene. So we'll see individuals display varying levels of steady state gene expression based on their genotype, usually at a nearby SNP. Now, the, we've been doing EQTL studies for a long time, and at this point we have studies that are upwards of thousands of individuals, and with these studies we've identified cis-EQTLs for essentially every gene in the human genome. So there's a lot of regulatory genetic variation in the population, and basically every gene has one or more uh, associated variants with its expression. Now, in theory, these EQTLs can be used to actually directly help us interpret GWAS and other disease-associated variants. If you have a genetic variant that's in some intergenic region, um, we'd like to be able to understand what it's actually doing to understand its mechanism. In theory, an EQTL can point to an association between that genetic variant and a target gene that we think it's affecting. So this variant that's disease-associated may also be associated with the expression level of one nearby gene, and that might actually fully disambiguate what this genetic variant is doing. So there are often many gen genes near a variant, but an EQTL can sometimes point us to a specific gene that that variant might affect, and therefore the gene product might actually be a good drug target, for example. So this is sort of the cartoon picture that's like the nice dream, and why we ran a lot of these big EQTL studies to begin with is the thinking that we could use them to interpret GWAS variants in this sense. Um, there are a lot of complications, though, on top of this, and I'll talk about a few of those today. The first, and one that my lab thinks a lot about, is that the effects of genetic variation are often actually quite context-specific. So many factors modulate regulatory genetic effects, including things like environmental factors, differences between the sexes, differences between cell types and tissues, that lead to things like varying levels of transcription factors or longer-term epigenetic changes that then alter the effect of a particular sequence variant that may change uh, which genes or when or how it changes gene expression. So all of these contexts can actually alter the effects of genetic sequence. And that, in fact, may actually be important to understanding disease. So diseases, a particular disease, may involve very specific cell types. It may involve very particular time points or environmental response, such as response to a, uh, infection. So these contexts may actually be important to understanding what a genetic variant is actually doing in the cell and when in order to really fully understand how this genetic variant leads to disease. Um, and this, is, this presents a big challenge, right? We don't have the ability to do EQTL studies in every possible context. We're starting to look at things like multiple tissues and multiple cell types, even using single cell data. But the thing that I want you to think about is really that all of this context specificity does lead us to need very specific data in some cases, and something that my lab talks, works a lot on, I won't have time to talk much about it today, but also tailored methods for uncovering this context specificity of these genetic effects. Um, the, the project that I'll tell you a little bit about at the beginning is the GTEx project, so I think this is a really good resource for beginning to interpret some of these GWAS variants um, because it does cover multiple cell types and multiple tissues. 
So the GTEx data um, in the last published release is the V6 data, uh, which has almost 500 donors and expression samples across 44 different tissues or 42 unique tissues. So this gives us over 7,000 total gene expression samples of about 500 individuals where we can look at the association between genotype and gene expression across nearly 50 tissues. So this is going to be updated very soon to the, the final public release of the GTEx data will be the V8 data, which will give us nearly 1,000 donors, so 838 that we've actually uh, used in EQTL analysis at this point, over 54 postmortem tissues, and actually all of the individuals come with whole genome sequencing in addition to genotyping and gene expression data. So that should be released uh, imminently. But we have taken all of these 42, 44, and now 50 different tissues uh, across the human body and actually run EQTL analysis for each one of these independently, looking for both cis EQTLs, or effects of genetic variation on a nearby gene, and trans EQTLs, which we define as an association between genotype and gene expression of a gene on a completely different chromosome. And we've done this for each one of the individual tissues. What you can see in this plot is every dot is a tissue. Um, the yellow dots are brain, for example, different brain regions. On the x-axis is sample size. On the y-axis is the proportion of tested genes that we find an EQTL from. So you can see that we are not fully saturating yet. We still, uh, in individual tissues, find at most about EQTLs for about half of the genes. But in total, together, from the V6 data, we found EQTLs for 19,725 genes have at least one EQTL. So again, across all tissues, we are finding an EQTL for nearly every gene in the genome. We also do find in this data set a handful of trans EQTLs, a little bit less than 100 across all tissues. So trans EQTLs are much harder to identify than cis. We have, um, our power is very far from complete to identify trans EQTLs, but cis EQTLs were getting close at this point. So you can immediately use the EQTLs that have been made available through GTEx and also through other large association studies such as EQTLGen, which has about 30,000 individuals just in whole blood. You can look up your variant of interest from your GWAS analysis or other variant of interest, and you can just check to see whether that variant has been previously associated with the expression of any given gene. So in the GTEx portal, for example, you can go type in your SNP and out pops and any tissue that you'd like or all tissues and out pops the association that you see between that SNP and nearby genes. Um, so you can immediately just look up and see if your SNP has EQTL effects on nearby genes. However, you should not stop there. Um, I think one thing that I definitely want to communicate is that if you go type in your SNP of interest, you're going to get out probably an association with something. Most SNPs are going to give you an association, especially once we start looking at very highly powered data sets such as GTEx or EQTL gen, again, over like 30,000 individuals. That is not complete information. And one thing that can go wrong is that you can actually see spurious associations that are actually driven by totally different causal variants between the EQTL and the GWAS signal but they're, they're in linkage disequilibrium. So your SNP is gonna look like an EQTL even though it is not actually causally affecting gene expression. So what this plot is showing is if you are looking at the, the association signal between two different phenotypes, uh, you know, sometimes you have nothing, sometimes you have an association in a single phenotype and for instance, no EQTL. But in this third row here, this is the case that you really wanna watch out for, which is that you do have association in this region with your, for example, GWAS in blue and EQTL in red. However, they are not the same signal. The causal variants are distinct. They are not shared, they're not sharing a mechanism. This EQTL does not in fact explain your GWAS hit. Um, what you want to see to actually start thinking, okay, maybe this gene is really mechanistically related to disease is something like the fourth row here where the signals completely overlap, what we call co-localize, and make it look like the EQTL might in fact be relevant to your GWAS hit. So this is something that's really important to look at and not simply just look up whether your SNP has some signal. Now, doing this is not as easy as eyeballing these cartoon plots here. Uh, co-localization is still a work in progress, I would say. Methods are still being actively developed and improved. But there are some that you can begin with. So there are Coloc, Enloc, Dabchi. All of these are publicly available tools that you can at least begin to use and see whether it looks like your GWAS hit co-localizes with the EQTLs you've identified. So this is an important first step. So doing this, uh, we took a large catalog of GWAS hits and intersected them with all of the EQTLs from every tissue in GTEx v6. 
um, using co-localization. And what we found here is that about half of the GWAS hits do appear to co-localize with some EQTL in some tissue in GTEx. And one very important note is that in many cases, it is in fact not the nearest gene that co-localizes with the GWAS association. So the sort of simple interpretation of take a GWAS hit and just pick the nearest gene is gonna be wrong about half the time, even when the GWAS hit does co-localize with an EQTL. So there are additional complications, even after you try something like this. One of the first is that our nice picture where our EQTL analysis and co-localization completely disambiguates our locus and points to a single target gene, it turns out is not true in many cases. In fact, often these GWAS hits co-localize with multiple genes. So there remains ambiguity of what the gene target is, or maybe there are actually more than one relevant gene target when you're doing this co-localization analysis. And this is particularly true when you start looking across many tissues or many contexts. In some cases, you will get a hit that co-localizes with one gene in brain and a different gene in liver. So if you don't know what the disease-relevant tissue is, you are still left with ambiguity in that case. Another complication that arises is allelic heterogeneity, meaning that there are potentially multiple different causal variants within a single locus. Um, so I'm showing you an example here of a GWAS hit that I was looking at recently on the top uh, left here. And when we first looked up this hit in EQTL and GTEx and looked for co-localization, even though there is an EQTL there, uh, what you can see is that they don't appear to co-localize at all. The strong variants from GWAS and their nearby linked targets are colored um, according to this color scale here. And you can see that none of the strong GWAS associations or anything in LD with it actually look like the signal in the EQTL analysis. So it did not appear to co-localize at all. However, um, based on our analysis, we thought that it actually looked like there might be more than one causal variant of this GWAS locus. So we did a conditional analysis, uh, essentially regressing out the effect of the very top hit, and there remains some signal at that point pointing to potentially a second causal variant that in fact does co-localize with this EQTL. So you can have a case where there are multiple causal variants in your GWAS analysis, only a subset of them are actually explained by the EQTL. In some cases, this makes sense, like the primary signal is actually a protein coding variant, and the secondary signal is an EQTL, but sometimes it's not even that clean, and you really don't know exactly what is causing some, low, low, uh, some of the variants from your GWAS to co-localize with EQTL and others not. And this gets complicated in the other direction, too. Many genes have more than one causal variant that affects their expression. So the EQTL signal itself also has allelic heterogeneity. So this is one of the reasons that I mentioned that co-localization is still a work in progress, is still under active development, because all of these multiple causal variants, that only some of which may overlap, um, really complicate identifying whether it's a shared signal between two traits or between a trait and an EQTL. So again, uh, getting back to context specificity, you know, many factors are affecting when and how these genetic sequence variants actually affect gene expression. Uh, we do, in fact, from GTEx see tissue specificity. So what we're showing here is both for cis EQTLs and trans EQTLs, the correlation between EQTL effect sizes between pairs of tissues. So every colored dot is a tissue, and the corresponding square in the heat map is showing you how strongly EQTL effects are correlated between the two tissues. And we do see clustering by, um, by related tissues. So for example, this top cluster are all the different brain regions that have strong correlation among them and not so much with the non-brain tissues. We also see groups of tissues such as multiple muscle tissues, multiple skin tissues, et cetera, that have very strong correlation amongst themselves. And when we start looking at simply whether an EQTL is shared between tissues, we do see that there are both substantial numbers of shared EQTLs that appear to have very general mechanism across tissues, and some that are very, very different between tissues and even specific to a single tissue in some cases. Now I'm gonna talk just very briefly about something exciting that we've been working on in the lab, which is after thinking about all of this tissue specificity, one thing that we thought about that we're really missing is actually dynamic processes, developmental processes, disease time courses, things like this. So the emergence of tissue specificity and these sort of cellular processes are actually very dynamic, but almost all of our EQTL analysis are performed in large cohorts that are static, single time point, almost all of them are adult, many of them are in fact post-mortem. So this sort of static data may not actually reflect the genetic effects in all of the diverse and disease-relevant contexts that we'd like to look at. 
And we think that some of these dynamic effects may actually be directly related to disease, such as if you have delay in an important regulatory change. So you may look at the adult, and there's no difference between their steady state expression from a healthy individual to an individual with a particular genetically influenced disease. But if you were actually able to go back and look at what happened during development, you might have seen a delay in emergence of a particular tissue-specific effect, for example. So to start thinking a little bit more about this and looking into what some of these effects might look like, we've collected a, a dynamic data set where we're actually looking at a cellular differentiation time course over time. So what we did is take all the iPSCs, this is the experimental work is done in the Galad lab in Chicago, where he has iPSC lines for actually 19 of the Yoruba hat map individuals. And for each one of these separately, we differentiated them towards cardiomyocytes. And every day during this differentiation, over 16 days, we collect RNA sequencing each day. And of course, the hat map individuals are genotypes, so we have that as well. And what we actually decided to look for here was genetic variants that change over time. So the EQTL effect size varies significantly during this differentiation time course, and we refer to these as dynamic QTLs. I don't have time to get into exactly how we did this, but we used basically a linear model that identifies an interaction between time period or time point in this differentiation and genotype. So we do find a number of these dynamic QTLs, and hopefully this gives you a sense, even though I'm not going into detail, of what they look like. So what we're showing here is every single day has a corresponding EQTL box plot shown here. So for the SNP, we have individuals who are GG or GA. And at the beginning, there's really not much difference between expression of the nearby gene FHL2 and genotype. And really only over uh, the time course do we start to see emergence of this um, of this effect of genotype on gene expression. So this gene is FHL2. This is actually a heart failure related uh, gene. Um, and the variant here actually lies in a heart specific promoter element, it turns out. So it's, it makes sense that you can see this heart specific regulatory effect emerging during the time course. Now, we think this is very interesting and you know, statistically and methodologically this was very cool to find. However, this is a variant that does ultimately have an effect in adult heart also. So that is not necessarily already showing us something new. It is showing us the temporal dynamics of this regulatory effect and the emergence of it during differentiation. But what we think is even more exciting is that in some cases there are transient genetic effects that emerge during differentiation and then disappear in the more mature cell type. So we, in this case, are looking for nonlinear dynamic QTLs and in particular transient effects that are only really strong during these intermediate points of differentiation. And we actually identified a large number of these, and some of them, in fact, do overlap with known GWAS hits. So this variant here, that is relevant only during days approximately five through 10, overlaps with a GWAS hit for body mass index. So some of these GWAS effects uh, hits that are not explained by even the largest EQTL cohorts may in fact be explained by more complex contexts, such as time periods during differentiation, responses to infection, and other things like that. So that concludes the common variant portion of my talk. And I think the messages that I want you to take away are, first of all, that EQTL data is useful for, for providing initial evidence of what the target genes are for non-coding disease-associated loci. You can look up these hits in EQTL data and get a good sense for what's going on. Um, but first of all, be sure you're actually looking at the full signal and doing co-localization and not just picking up something that's a spurious association due to linkage disequilibrium. So make sure you're thinking about co-localization. But bear in mind that that's not going to be a perfect solution either. So there remain Lots of complications, including multiple causal variants in both the disease association and the EQTL associations. You, in many cases, may find multiple co-localizing target genes, so don't just test co-localization of the nearest gene or the one that, in your head, you think sounds like the right target. You know, test association and co-localization with all of the nearby genes. Uh, you, in many cases, will find more than one, and you may find more than one or different ones in different tissues and different contexts. So there will still remain lots of follow-up to do based on your initial EQTL analysis to really disambiguate what the locus is doing. And one thing that I do want to think about more is that in many cases, we don't know. We may think we know what the right cell type for a given disease is, but we don't. And we don't know the right cell type, and we don't know the right context. But I do want to emphasize that I think, in many cases, adult steady state tissue may not be sufficient. And that may be part of why we're only finding EQTL associations for about half of the non-coding loci that we test.
Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go on and tell you a little bit about the work that we started to do with rare variation. So the motivation here is that we all have a lot of rare variants, so each one of us is walking around with something like 50,000 variants that are found in the population at less than a minor allele frequency of 1%. Most of them, again, are non-coding. Um, and the impact of most of these is simply unknown. So we do know that rare variants are enriched for basically any deleterious annotation that you can look up, uh, but any given rare variant that I hand to you we know almost nothing about it, and our prediction is very limited in terms of figuring out which ones are actually going to be functional or relevant to expression or relevant to disease. So the current methods that are available for scoring rare variants are, are simply not robust enough for use in many research applications and certainly for clinical uh, applications currently. So we wanted to think, what can we do with this? What can we do to start to understand the impact of rare regulatory variation? So the simple idea that we began with is that we can use RNA-seq, just like we've used EQTL analysis to understand common variants. We can use personal transcriptomics to start to understand rare variants. So the thought is that a functional variant is going to cause some sort of disruption at a cellular level, regardless of its allele frequency. We should be able to see some effect uh, it, on the cell if the variant is actually doing something. And if it's a regulatory variant, the hypothesis, of course, is that it will change gene expression. So a very strong, rare regulatory variant will often result in very high or low expression of a nearby gene compared with the rest of the population. So the simple approach that we're taking is to identify individuals who are outliers in gene expression. So if you take a single gene, you can look at what the normal population uh, levels of expression for that gene look like, and you can identify individuals who are simply very extreme, either too high or too low compared to the rest of the population. And those can be used to start to understand the effects of rare variation. So we again turn to the GTEx data to look at this. So now in V8, we have about 714, we focused on a single ancestry here for simplicity, 714 European ancestry individuals, again, RNA-seq across up to 52 tissues and whole genome sequencing. Looking at the individuals who do display very extreme levels of gene expression in this cohort, we see that they are in fact enriched, if you then turn to their whole genome sequence, for rare variants that are nearby those extreme genes, ex extremely high or low expressed genes. So what you can see here is you take all of our individuals who have extreme gene expression actually displayed across all the tissues that we've measured for them, we take the median across tissues. So these are individuals who display extreme gene expression, and they show approximately two-fold enrichment in number of rare variants that we observe near those genes. And this is true even if you look at a single tissue. Uh, I will say that a single RNA sequencing sample for an individual is often very noisy, so you don't get quite as nice signal if you just look at one sample or one tissue as if you look at the median across multiple tissues, maybe not surprisingly. So what do these look like? So here what we're showing is individuals who are very, um, ex express the gene very highly. Uh, at the top, the middle are individuals who are non-outliers. The bottom is individuals who underexpress the, the gene in an extreme way um, to varying degrees. So these are just z-score thresholds, again, with the non-outliers in the middle getting to uh, overexpression outliers at, at the top and underexpression outliers at the bottom. And these essentially show us the proportion of those individuals who have a nearby rare variant within 10 kb and all the different annotations that we find for those rare variants. So we can see that things like structural variants uh, are often associated with very high overexpression or very low underexpression. The underexpression individuals, again, maybe not surprisingly, have many more deletions, uh, whereas the overexpression individuals have things like duplications. We also see big effects of frame shift variants, um, stop variants, and things like this. But you can see that many of our extreme expression individuals do have a nearby rare variant that looks like it's explaining the effect. So we're not just looking at total expression, and this is something to keep in mind too, is that you know, your disease-associated variant, whether rare or common, may affect expression, but it may affect other things such as alternative splicing in addition. So we've started looking at a lot at alternative splicing in the context of rare variants. Uh, this is somewhat harder to do because you don't just over or under express when you're talking about abnormal splicing and you have a gene with J junctions, you might be extreme in any of two to the J possible different directions. So it's actually computationally more challenging to identify 
identify these alternative splicing outliers. I'm not going to talk about this for time today, but we do have a new method for identifying them just based on, again, computing a standard Dirichlet multinomial across healthy individuals and then comparing how far away any given individual is from that. Um, and this is an example of the type of outlier we find when we apply that method to the GTEx data. So this is an example from muscle. Uh, the pink pile up is representing the reads that we observe for someone that we identified as an outlier uh, versus in black, someone that is very close to the population mean. Um, so that you can see the outlier individual appears to be re retaining a portion of in an intron that the normal individuals do not, and that is not an annotated uh, exonic region in this gene. When we look at these individuals, we actually observe really extreme enrichment, um, particularly for variants that are in or near the canonical splice sites. So you can see on here, the x-axis is showing us the window around the splice site, and we see really, really extreme enrichment for um, individuals having one of these variants for cases where we have an individual that we call a splicing outlier. Uh, we find a number of other interesting effects that I don't have time to get into today, but one that I did want to mention is that we actually see enrichment not only right in these you know, very small sequences around the splice site, but also in more distant regions such as the polypyrimidine tract. So what I'm showing here is that individuals who are outliers at an annotated known splice site often have a change in the polypyrimidine tract where they're going from a pyrimidine to a purine, whereas individuals who are outliers and the junction that we're looking at is actually not annotated, so they look like they have a new splice site, uh, we actually see the reverse, that in many cases they're going from a purine to a pyrimidine. And we see corresponding changes in the actual canonical sites as well in terms of the alleles that switch. Um, but this was kind of a neat result because it was a little bit further away and maybe not as expected. So the Alternative splicing outliers do look pretty different from the expression outliers, so this is going to be just a quick visual that, um, you know, reminder of what the expression outliers look like. The alternative splicing outliers look pretty different, even just at a first glance. They have a lot fewer structural variants. They do have a lot more enrichment um, of variants that occur right in the splice donor or acceptor. Uh, we do see a number of coding variants that affect splicing as well, but you can see these different types of outliers really are pointing us to different types of functional rare variants in these individuals. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about today is taking all of this work that we've done in, in understanding what these gene expression outliers are telling us about the possible nearby rare variants, but actually use that to try to start to build a method for prioritizing rare variants for an individual genome. This is something that eventually we'd like to see used clinically um, with actual whole genome interpretation. So the idea is you start with someone's whole genome sequence and a number of variants that you've identified. Uh, there are methods already for taking genomic features of that variant, so things like is it in a regulatory element? Is it in a conserved region? Any sort of information you can collect from ENCODE or roadmap epigenomics, et cetera, and combine that all together using machine learning and estimate the probability that a given variant actually has an effect. And there are a number of methods that have been developed in recent years that attempt to do just that. So we're not going to try to improve on that exactly. We're actually going to use those scores in addition as input. What we're going to do is say, well, how much further can we get beyond just what we know about the human genome if we add RNA sequencing in the same individual to our approaches and look at whether they're extreme in terms of expression or splicing or other effects we can see in the transcriptome and use that in combination with the genome to then estimate the overall probability that any given variant has an effect in this individual. So the method that we initially developed, this is published uh, in 2017, is called RIVER. So this is RNA-informed variant effect on regulation. And one nice thing about this model is that it's actually trained in a completely unsupervised manner. So you do not need to have a set of rare variants that you think have a functional effect and a set that you think don't. Um, I will argue that constructing such a set is very hard to do without introducing some sort of bias. Uh, so we don't need any labels at all to train this. So whether or not a variant has a functional effect is always unobserved in our model. What we have is just the whole genome sequence and any annotations that you can gather about the region where you see a particular variant, and then simply measurements from RNA. So for instance, outlier status of a nearby gene. And the model can combine these signals together to give you the posterior that you, that you want over this unobserved variable of whether or not the variant actually has a regulatory effect given the data that you've collected. And actually, the model can be used 
With just whole genome sequencing, even if you haven't measured RNA, it can be used with RNA even if you don't have any of the genomic annotations, or it can combine the two together and give you a posterior over the effect of your variant given, given both. We have recently extended this model to integrate lots of different signals together, so my student, being very clever, decided to call it watershed, as a, as a collection of multiple rivers coming together. Uh, so here, we're able to model total expression, alternative splicing as a separate phenotype, allele-specific expression as a separate phenotype, and actually across each tissue individually. So you can consider every tissue separately, or you can consider them together. If you've measured anything else, such as um, chromatin state or protein or anything else, you can actually combine that into this watershed model. And again, we have genomic annotations on the variant that you're trying to estimate effect of, and then any of your cellular phenotypes that you have measured. And then we're able to infer posteriors that tell us the probability that a given variant is affecting any of the cellular processes or tissues that you've looked at uh, individually or together. So applying watershed, I mean, the, the main thing I want you to take away from this is not just that our model is nice, but that adding RNA sequencing into these types of prediction tasks gives you a huge boost over looking at the genome alone. So GAM here means genome annotation model, so basically that's the model that does not look at RNA at all, and the solid lines here are watershed, which does look at RNA, and we're looking at effects on three different cellular phenotypes here, allele-specific expression, alternative splicing, and total expression, and you can see that adding in RNA-seq gives you a huge boost over trying to use only information from the genome alone. So this is a precision recall curve here and just showing the AUCs go up dramatically for all three of these phenotypes. And you can run this for, you know, a tissue-specific model across all the tissues together uh, as well, and you see a big boost there in addition. So adding an RNA-seq makes a big difference. You can also use this, so not only to prioritize variants for a new individual, but you can use this in some cases to go back and see what a disease variant is doing to the cell. Just like we go back and look at EQTL data for GWAS, you can start to look at individuals who have some of these rare variants to understand what the variants are doing at a cellular level. So first what I'm showing on the left is simply that the ClinVar pathogenic regulatory variants um, all have very, very high scores according to our model. And and our model separates those known pathogenic variants from non-pathogenic variants much better than using the genome alone here on top, oh sorry, the gene expression alone on top, which does begin to separate them but does not do that well, using the genome annotations alone, which again provides some signal, but combining the two together simply gives us a much better ability to separate these pathogenic variants from non-pathogenic variants, and there's a subset of them that our model is very, very confident about because they have strong signal both from RNA and from the genome annotations. But you can start to go into actual individuals who have these variants and see what they're doing. So for example, one variant that appears in ClinVar um, is, is a variant in SBDS. There's actually three individuals in GTEx who, have, who are heterozygous for this uh, recessive syndrome and have variants that, you know, if they were homozygous, would cause it. Uh, this is a recessive syndrome with systemic symptoms. So there are symptoms in neurological symptoms, digestive systems, just sort of sy syst uh, systemic sy sy symptoms, excuse me, across the body. And what you can see is that if you actually look at the individuals who have this variant, or one of the two variants that is um, in ClinVar annotated for this disorder, across all the different tissues, for most tissues, these individuals are extreme underexpressors. So the, the star and the two triangles are the individual's gene expression levels who have this variant, and the box plots are the normal distribution of gene expression uh, across GTEx. You can see that these individuals dramatically underexpress this gene across many tissues. And there's only a tiny number of tissues here at the bottom that they're near normal for, um, but pretty much everywhere else they're underexpressors. Some of the variants that we've looked up have a much more tissue-specific pattern that, are, that this variant uh, has a very strong effect on gene expression only in a subset of tissues. But what I'm arguing is that if you have individuals who harbor one of these variants, and in many cases there are individuals who are healthy, who are heterozygous for these disease-causing variants, you can still use those individuals to see what the cellular effects of these variants are in a nice way. So that gives you kind of a sense for what we're doing with rare variants, and here what I want you to take away is that it is the case that rare genetic variants do coincide with extreme changes to gene expression in many cases, but it's not always just gene expression. So we can use very diverse signals from transcriptomic data, such as alternative splicing or tissue-specific expression or things like this, and we can use all of these to prioritize rare variants from full personal genomes. And that can help us, you know, disambiguate 
what are the you know, target genes and molecular effects of various rare disease variants, in addition to helping us identify or diagnose individuals with rare diseases where they have a regulatory as opposed to coding variant that might be causing disease. And we have, at the moment, combined all of these signals into a model called Watershed that is able to take all of these different signals together to prioritize rare variants um, and hopefully identify those that have functional effects. So with that, I'd just like to thank all of the students in my lab and postdocs in my lab who contributed to these projects, uh, the students and Yoav Galad at Chicago that worked on the dynamic QTL data, uh, Stephen Montgomery's lab who has collaborated not only on GTEx in general, but also on the rare variant project with me, um, in addition to Tuli Lapalainen's lab working on that as well, and, and uh, the entire GTEx consortium. So thanks very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.